Welcome to SFC Church at Home. We are so glad that you decided to join us today. Let's worship together. and generous in your giving to SFC. This week we partnered with Olive Crest by supporting several foster families in our community. Please continue to pray with us for the 10,000 foster kids in our state. As a reminder, we have three ways to give through our website, app, or mailing a check directly to the church. Thank you for your generosity. Hey, good morning, Sumner Family Church. I'm glad we can come together and get in God's word today. Uh, we're going to continue in our awkward series, and one of the things that we've been saying 
um, is that the natural tendency uh, for us is to lean away from awkward moments when they come our way and to avoid them altogether. We've also said that leaning into the awkward moments can really open up the, uh, the door for God to do his best work in our lives. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about different things that awkward does. And, um, and one of the things that we talked about is how the more grace you have, the less awkward it feels. You know, we walk in grace because there's been grace that has been extended to us and given to us. We also talked about ego and how the more ego you have, the more awkward it gets. Ego has this way of really revealing what is inside of our hearts. And there really isn't a lot of room for Jesus when our hearts are filled with a lot of ego. But we also talked about how awkward moments can provide opportunities for leadership and influence in others' lives as well. And then last week for Mother's Day, Kim talked about how life's detours can be awkward and lead us to greater faith. Well, today we're going to talk about generosity and, uh, and being all in on the mission. And um, being all in is a, is a pretty important thing because I don't know how many of you have ever tried serving God with a half of a heart or uh, being halfway in or having one foot in and one foot out, but it doesn't, it doesn't really work all that well. Our big idea today is the economy of heaven is awkward when you are not all in. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts today and the economy of heaven. We're going to see one good example and a bad example that really turns into an awkward moment. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, it says, All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. And we get this picture of the early church, and we see an example of this as we move into chapter 4. And it talks about how the believers shared their possessions. And uh, I want to move into verse 32, which says, All the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. And the, the apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Well, what we see here is the early church is really um, operating in this spirit of, of generosity where Christ is being lifted up and the people are spreading the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. We see it uh, with, even within the community where people are selling the stuff that they have to help propel the mission of God forward and to care for people's needs. It was a powerful way of doing life and it worked. And it really speaks to what the economy of heaven really looks like. This is the church right here in action. This is a church that we would want to be a part of and uh, the church that I think every Christ follower wants to be. And so how does the kingdom of, uh, of heaven or the economy of heaven differ from other economies? On earth, we live in what I'm going to uh, call human economies. And I want to just preface to say that I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm not an economist. And I'm going to do my very best to explain a little bit of this. But in, human, uh, in a human economy where everyone has the same amount, um, we might call this socialism. Uh, the downside is that even though it sounds fair, what it doesn't do is it, it doesn't reward fair because people work different hours, have different responsibilities with different experiences. So it doesn't reward well. Rather, what it does in people is it demotivates people from working hard and using their gifts. There's another system that we would call communism where there's a controlling party who gets to decide who gets what, and they get the rest. And over time, what happens is you get less, and somebody 
gets all the rest. You might say, man, that, that doesn't seem right. That's not fair. It doesn't take into account um, really the giftedness and the passions that people have. After all, I mean, hasn't God wired us to use our gifts and to do good works? What if you can use your gifts, your talents, and you can get as much as you want? We might call that capitalism. And uh, attached into our wiring along with the entrepreneur inside of us is to use our giftedness and to see things multiply. But the downside um, is uh, we become very susceptible to lust and pride and greed. And you can actually get to a place where you have a whole nation that won't share with others. It's a dangerous place to find yourself. And so really, what is the economy of, of heaven, and what does it look like when God is in control? Where he's reigning and the church is involved uh, by multiplying and sharing their gifts, and there's kingdom impact. I think we see it right here in, in Acts chapter 4. Uh, the first thing that I wrote down is that in the economy of heaven, what we see is that everything belongs to God. And in verse 4, uh, verse 32 of Acts chapter 4, it says, All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. These people were of the mind that what they had was not theirs. And that's a pretty amazing idea, that what you own is not your own. What is it that might cause someone to actually think this way? It's probably someone who truly believes that everything belongs to God. You know, oftentimes we have this mindset that we are owners, when really what we are is, is managers of what is God's, managing what is His. He's entrusted us with, with everything that He has blessed us with. In fact, this is an exciting and powerful way um, to live because we're not living for ourselves. We're not trying to gain something for ourselves, but rather what we are doing is we're leveraging what God has to make the greatest impact for the mission and the kingdom of God. It's living a life that says, it's not what I own because it's God's. Rather, I'm just managing and taking care of it. A classic example of this just might be um, a car. Um, we love our cars, and there is a huge difference between owning a car and renting a car. When you own a car, it's yours. You're taking care of it. You'll, you'll do things to kind of baby it and keep it safe and protected. You'll even park on the other side of a parking lot where there's no cars, just so it won't get a ding or a scratch. And it, it's, it's safe. Why? Because it's your baby. But when you're renting a car, um, you don't treat it that way at all. Uh, and, and in fact, um, you might run over a curb and uh, just say, oh, uh, didn't mean to do that, but not really think much of it. Why? Because um, you're renting it. It's, it's not yours. Um, you might back over spikes at an airport and think to yourself with, with an attitude of, who cares? It's just a, a rental car. I don't own this thing. I know that's a little extreme, but you, you kind of get the point. Um, I want you to just think for a moment what would happen if, if you looked at your car with the understanding of God owns my car. Um, I don't know if that changes anything for you, but I think what it should do is to empower us to say that not only is this car for me, but I can use this car to make a difference in my sphere of influence. You begin to understand what it means to have your car on the mission or your house on the mission, or my money, using it for the mission. And when you start to think that way, life comes alive. And all of a sudden, we're not living for ourselves, but we're living for God, because what we understand is that everything belongs to Him. The second thing is, is in the economy of heaven, Jesus is at the center. And in chapter 4, verse 33, it says, The apostles testified 
powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. In the economy of heaven, God is the owner, we are the managers, and then we come to this place of realizing that Jesus is at the center of it. And we see this with the early church, where everyone is sharing, and Jesus is central to what is going on here. In systems of human economy, we tend to be the ones that are at the center, or maybe there's somebody who's a controlling party or a controlling group that is at the center. But in the kingdom of heaven, Christ is at the center. That's a powerful truth right there. We, we look uh, to the words of Christ to really lead us and guide us to make the largest and greatest kingdom impact. One of the things that Jesus said to us is that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. There's two options there. You see, when we're at the center, what we end up doing is we end up serving money, not God. And Jesus came to set us free. He came to set us free from the anxiety and the stress of money when it's really at the center of our life. You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he said, don't worry about what you're going to eat and drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. These are the things that people who don't know God chase after. And then in verse 33, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be given to you as well. You know, right now, I, I believe that uh, many people um, are carrying heavy burdens and heavy weights and, um, and weighted down by this, this pandemic and asking questions like, is the economy ever going to turn around? Um, you know, what's going to happen with my job? What does my future look like? And these are fair questions when there's so much uncertainty around us. Um, and we continue to think of ourselves as owners, and I get it. You know, we want to protect the things that um, we've worked so hard for. But I really believe that in times like we find ourselves in right now, what we need is godly biblical perspectives to really gain a right understanding. And I believe one of those um, is right before us today, that we come to understand that God is the owner of all things. He's the owner of our possessions. We are just simply managers. And I'm simply managing what he is at work doing. And when we understand this and when we live life this way, what it does is it takes a little bit of the pressure and frees us from the stress of having to serve money or be a slave to money. Remember, in the economy of heaven, Christ is at the center. What a powerful truth. I, I want you to think about a church where we are all using our gifts and our talents with Christ at the center. The third thing that I wrote down is that in the economy of heaven, the spirit is a movement of generosity. And we see it here in verse 34 and 35. There were no needy people among them because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. It says that there were no needy people among them. Just get your arms around that for a moment. That is so um, foreign to our culture. Yes, there were different classes of, of people and some some were even looked down upon, but in the church community, it was so much different. Why? Because there was so much grace that was being poured out on this community of believers because there was a movement of generosity taking place within the community. It wasn't because they had to, but rather because they wanted to. They wanted to see God at work. They managed it and they gave it away to see a movement take place and to see the grace of God at work. You know, I, I will never forget a moment, a time where Kim and I 
were on the receiving end of a spirit of generosity. My, my oldest um, son was born in Astoria, Oregon. And um, Kim's doctor uh, at that time was a little bit of an intimidating uh, lady. Uh, she was really hard on ladies that she was caring for. She was very matter of fact. She was very blunt. And at the end of the day, what she really wanted was the best for her patients. We had heard a number of stories of, of ladies who really didn't like her. And Kim had kind of made it a point in her own heart and mind that she was, she was really going to do her very best to be a blessing to her doctor during this time and uh, show her the love of Christ and uh, do her best in, in that and just let God be at work. I'll never forget when she um, delivered our son and she held him and handed him to Kim and uh, asked the question, what are you going to name this baby boy? And Kim looked at her and said, his name is Davis. Uh, it's my maiden name. And the look on her face was an expression that just lit up. And she said, that's my son's name. And uh, we obviously didn't know that. Um, but a couple weeks later, Kim and I went to her office to make a payment on our, our bill. The lady at the front desk took the bill and she said, I'll be right back. And she went to the very back of the office. She came back. She had a very surprised look on her face and let us know your bill has been paid for in full. And um, Kim and I were stunned. We were absolutely floored. You see, I really believe the love of Christ sparked a spirit of generosity in Kim's doctor. This was a moment for us to understand that when we put ourselves um, or don't put ourselves at the center, but we put Jesus at the center, realizing that everything belongs to him anyways, it can spark this movement a movement in a culture, a movement in a community, a movement in a people where you unleash a spirit of generosity and it, it then turns into um, unleashing that in others. It was a powerful moment for us and we've seen God do that time and time again in our lives and throughout our marriage. It's been a powerful thing. I'll never forget a lady in our church who lost her husband after a long health battle. And there came a point where she just shared with me, listen, if somebody, you know, wants to donate flowers or give money, um, I, I want to ask that you would ask them to donate that and give what they would give for flowers, give money towards kids who are going to be going to summer camp this uh, summer on her husband's behalf. And I just thought to myself, man, that is so awesome. It was this powerful thing um, for our church uh, to hear and see the mission at work. And I, I just wonder what creative thing might the Holy Spirit lay on your heart to unleash someone for the mission? You know, what if Sumner Family Church lived out this same spirit of, of generosity I don't know, has there really ever been a greater time than right now to demonstrate a spirit of generosity to others? I mean, this just seems like the, the best time and the most powerful moment. Um, maybe God is prompting you to, to give something away or to sell something and give it to the mission. I, I want you to know that every week as a staff and as a team, we're looking for ways to give back and to be a blessing in our community. And we've done that in a number of ways. Um, we've given to first responders um, at Good Sam Hospital. Um, we've tried to bless local businesses. We did it through teacher appreciation, um, through the White River Outreach, the Sumner Food Bank. Um, this week, we're, um, we're giving to Olive Crest. And Olive Crest uh, ministers to at-risk children through foster care and adoption. And so um, we're going to continue to look for ways to be a blessing and to demonstrate a spirit of generosity so that we can propel the mission of God forward. 
Maybe you are someone who wants to get in on this spirit of generosity going above and beyond during these times. And one of the things that we just thought we might do is create uh, an opportunity for you uh, when you give. If you give online, uh, there's a new line for you to give uh, called Benevolence. And um, you can give whatever amount you would want to give to help um, propel a spirit of generosity uh, as we give throughout the community in our church. If you give through the mail, um, if you uh, give uh, in one, on one of our giving envelopes, make sure that you mark in the other uh, line benevolence and what you're giving for towards that. Or, you know, you can just put a note in with your check um, that lets us know that you want to designate for benevolence. Again, I don't know that there's ever been a greater time for us as a church than right now to demonstrate a spirit of generosity. Um, we see a good example in chapter four. We're gonna kind of move right in as we close our time of looking at uh, a bad example an, uh, that becomes an awkward moment in chapter five. And it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira and how they bring conflict to the community that held all things in common. You know, Ananias and Sapphira, they're a married couple who are a part of the early church, a part of uh, the way. And after lying, lying to um, some of the leaders and to the community of believers about proceeds um, from the sale of some land that they had, they're confronted. And it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money that you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not just lied to human beings, but to God and the Holy Spirit. When Ananias heard this, he fell down, and it says that he died. Sapphira would also be questioned, and like her husband, she fell down and she died. And the story concludes in verse 11 that great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. This, this is crazy, and this is an awkward story. You read this, and there are a lot of questions that come to mind. Um, like, man, this, this seems kind of harsh. Like, did they really have to die? Did it have to be really this intense of an example? Um, I know that there was greed in their hearts, and I know that they lied, but are there other ways that they could have been made examples? Interesting thinking. Um, you know, we're seeing firsthand that the economy of heaven, in the economy of heaven, everything belongs to God. And Ananias and Sapphira stop seeing themselves as managers, and once again, they become owners. And when you're an owner, one of the things that you really want the most of is control. Generosity becomes replaced with control. And Ananias and Sapphira had lost what it was all about. Obviously, they are following the good example that was set out before them or laid out before them in chapter 4 by Barnabas, who had sold some property. And they're thinking to themselves, well, we can sell some property too. But in the midst of it all, Satan got a hold of their heart and greed sets in. They're not accused of lying to the apostles, but rather it was said to them, you have lied to the Holy Spirit and God himself. That, that's serious and, and that's awkward. We're reminded that what we have doesn't belong to us, but to God with Jesus at the center. The last thing that I wanna share with you is that the economy of heaven has a bottom line. And really the bottom line is this. The bottom line is about making him no, it's the announcing that God's kingdom uh, is here and that he reigns. And when the church gets this in, in their heart and in their spirit, it really becomes this unstoppable force 
Remember, the economy of heaven is that God owns it, we manage it, and Jesus is at the center. And the bottom line for us is making the kingdom of God known to our sphere of influence, to our community, to those around us, to those that we lead and have influence with. I just believe that we, wanna, we want to figure out where we can make the greatest impact for the kingdom of God. You know, many of you, you have talents and you have gifts and you're gifted in such a way that you can use those and multiply those for the glory of God. And there's this joy that we have when we share with others that is just amazing, not because we have to, but because we want to. And we're allowing ourselves to be led by the Spirit in doing so. You know, this morning, as we conclude here, perhaps you would make a note of some things that you've been holding on to that are, are holding you back from going all in or from doing something that you feel that God wants you to do. And the question I want to close with today and ask you is what would it take for you to go all in? Not just one foot in with one foot out, not half-hearted, but all in. All in where you can look past yourself where you can look past seeing yourself as an owner, but a manager, where you have it in you to demonstrate a spirit of generosity to those around you. You know, maybe something has been holding you back from moving forward that way. What would it mean for you to go all in? And I just believe this, that for some to go all in, it just simply re means receiving God's grace and love for your life. So I want to pray with you as we, uh, as we uh, close our time together and reflect on what God is speaking to our hearts. So Heavenly Father, we start right here. And today we choose you by receiving your grace and your love for our lives. As we seek you, I just pray that you would make yourself known to us and that you would meet us right where we're at. Lord, we acknowledge our need for you today, and we are reminded that you have not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. I just pray that you would fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit and reveal where you're calling us to go all in. We embrace in our hearts that we get to be a part of the economy of heaven. We understand that you own everything and you have simply entrusted us to manage what you put in front of us. We acknowledge that Jesus is at the center. So Lord, would you just place within each one of us a spirit of generosity. Open our eyes and our hearts to the needs of those around us. There is no better time than right now To make you know. God, I pray that you would give us the opportunity, you would open the door to take advantage of this time in our sphere of influence. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I want to just pray God's blessings upon you, and uh, I want to encourage you that as we continue in, in these days and in this time to be fearless. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. We would love to see you this week online in one of our online small groups. Email info at sumnerfamilychurch.com to join. God bless you.